Welcome to Building Tomorrow, a show exploring the ways that tech, innovation, and entrepreneurship are creating a freer, wealthier, and more peaceful world. As always, I'm your host, Paul Matsko, and with me in the studio today are Aaron Powell and Matthew Feeney. Now, today we're going to talk about the hot topic of DNA databases, which have implications for everything from fighting crime, uh, the Fourth Amendment, the Constitution, medical innovation, and the answer to that eternal teenage question, mom, dad, who are all these random second cousins at the family reunion? Why should I care? Uh, but let's start with a killer, the Golden State Killer specifically. Uh, Matthew, why, why don't you kick us off? Why does the capture of a serial killer from the 70s in California matter to those interested in DNA databases? Yeah, so some listeners might already be aware that earlier this year, uh, police in California made an arrest of the alleged uh, Golden State Killer. Uh, this was uh, a killer who... Uh, not only killed about a dozen people, but also committed uh, dozens of, of rapes and uh, a ton of burglaries. And this uh, this killer and rapist had been rather elusive for decades. Uh, but the police finally arrested a suspect thanks to uh, a website that uh, many people associate with uh, family tree research, right? So the p police in this case, they had DNA that had been left over at a couple of the crime scenes, but uh, the DNA wasn't really getting uh, getting them very far, right? And someone, and I'm sure there'll be a really interesting, I don't know, HBO miniseries about this in the coming years, uh, decided like, well, why don't we get this uh, DNA and upload it to one of these sites uh, like 23andMe or MyHeritage, Ancestry, uh, that specializes in family tree ancestry research. Uh, so they they plug it in. The actual name of the website uh, was GED Match in this case. And doing that, they were able to identify uh, the suspect's great, great, great grandparents. Uh, the suspect was not in was not in one of these websites, but uh, everyone listening uh, should be aware that they have 32 great, great, great grandparents. Uh, so with that information uh, and information based on other people who had uploaded their DNA to the site, they were able to build a family tree or actually numerous family trees to try and identify uh, who the suspect might be, and whittling it down uh, from uh, the the family tree total, they they took it down to uh, people who are the right age, the right location, the right profile, and they identified one suspect uh, who turned out to not be the right person. But they went down the list to another suspect, waited for what the police have described as discarded DNA, which would be DNA found in the trash, whether that's um, hair from uh, a comb or uh, a used toothbrush. We don't know exactly what kind of DNA that was. And they compared the discarded DNA to the DNA from the crime scene and boom, they had a match. Uh, and so this uh, this guy has been arrested and a uh, trial is pending. Yeah, it's the kind of thing just for our listeners to get a sense of what this looks like, we'll have to put up in the show notes a uh, – uh, an example family tree for how this works, but it's a matter of triangulation. So you take this database, they're unlikely to have the actual DNA of the offender, mm -hmm. but using, you can kind of uh, extrapolate into the past connections between multiple second or even third or fourth degree cousins. So as long as there's two within this broad family tree going back six or seven generations, you can, from the kind of the, the similarities between those cousins, you can triangulate the suspect in the family tree, right? And so with that grandfather, with how many was it, 32 family trees potential there, um, you can identify which one of those family trees the killer's in. And so then you go through a pool of suspects and that really narrows down that pool of say several dozen or several hundred suspects tremendously. Okay, which one of our suspects belongs in that family tree that we just triangulated from a DNA match? Mm -hmm. Um, but maybe, maybe we should take a step back. Uh, so we've got police catching the Golden State Killer using a DNA database like 23andMe and Ancestry. That's not what these databases were designed to do, right? They were designed to do something else. Uh, I think, Matthew, you said that you are on one of these? Yeah, it was a really interesting writing uh, about this case uh, because I actually – uh, am a 23andMe customer. I'm also a uh, MyHeritage customer. So 
Uh, family history is a bit of a, a side hobby of mine. I'm very interested in uh, history. Not not everyone is, thinks this is a rather odd hobby, right? But it, it interests me. Uh, so you, uh, at least with 23andMe, you, you sign up and they send you a kit. You spit in the tube. Uh, you send back the tube and they whirl it around and uh, analyze your DNA. Uh, and they can give you uh, ancestry information. So these are the kind of uh, ethnic groups uh, that your ancestors are associated with. Uh, you can also sign up for health information, uh, 23andMe. Uh, after a few fights with the FDA, I should add, uh, are now allowed to uh, screen the DNA for um, certain risks, uh, certain diseases that you, you may carry. And uh, using that data, you can upload uh, 23andMe data to MyHeritage, uh, which is not only has a uh, ethnicity estimator tool, but also a family tree building tool. And the the crucial thing to keep in mind here is that uh, it's a cliche, but it's true. But we're all related, right? That uh, actually, all the three of us sitting in the studio, we really wouldn't have to go that far back at all in human history to find uh, a shared ancestor for the three of us. Uh, like like we mentioned earlier, uh, you only have to go back a few generations before you have 32 direct ancestors and uh, within about a dozen or so uh, generations you have thousands of uh, direct ancestors. Uh, so we are all all related and uh, many, many people you pass all the time will be uh, third, fourth, fifth, whatever cousins. And uh, so building a family tree like this uh, for this investigation proved really valuable. Uh, and what what's interesting is I think a lot of people found this kind of intuitively creepy, uh, but for, for for reasons that are difficult to pin down, right? Because uh, they were only able to do this because a lot of this uh, alleged killer's uh, distant relatives had the same impulse as me and were interested in family history and you know uploaded this data. Uh, and this doesn't seem to be a, a violation of their privacy. Right, because they were the ones who signed up for the service. Uh, it's clearly not a violation of the privacy of the killer, because you don't really have an expectation of privacy to DNA you've left at your murder scene, <laughs> right? Uh, Nor do you have the expectation in other people's DNA, right? Uh, and and everyone should be aware that in their own family tree there are going to be angels and demons, right? That uh, you dig far enough, you'll find people like the Golden State Killer in your family tree, but you also find. Uh, really nice people too. Uh, so it, it's difficult to pin down where this uneasiness comes from, especially given that the, the privacy violation seems a little difficult to pin down. Uh, the only thing uh, that I've discussed with colleagues here is uh, the, the going through the trash, right, to, the, to find the discarded DNA there. But uh, that's been upheld as uh, constitutional. It's not an issue. Uh, and this is hardly the most sympathetic suspect in a case like that. What's Interesting about this this particular story, um, aside from just the the kind of awesome cleverness of the sleuthing, mm. is is that it flips the script on how we think about DNA evidence and the the role that it plays in investigation. Because until now, DNA evidence was almost existed as a verification technique, right? So it was it was like you had largely you did traditional police work and found your suspect. And then the DNA was what then told you you'd gotten the right guy, right? But the DNA wasn't itself what really led you to the suspect because you didn't have a database that you I mean, there's to some extent that did exist, but very small scale. And so in most cases, the DNA could not lead you to the suspect. But instead, what we have now is it, it almost makes it look more like the kind of movie style criminal profiling, you know, like serial killer profiling, where we just we put this stuff out. We get like some information about our killer. We don't really know what it means or where it points, and then we put it out there and and develop a picture that then narrows down the field of people. And so you know, like the kind of person who commits this crime is probably over forty five and white and must be this tall and so on and so forth. And so it's we've turned DNA into the FBI profiling, like that show was it Criminal Mind Lines? Hunter? Oh, um, Mind Hunter. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, that's a better show. That sort of thing. Um, and I wonder if that that is part of the creepiness is is this notion that we're now all kind of in this potentially in this massive system that that the government can just reach into and pluck us out of um, instead of having to you know 
figure out who it is, that, it, that at any time there's stuff that we're leaving behind that we don't really have any control about leaving. You're always leaving hair and skin and you know, it's um, – it would be awfully hard to not leave DNA trace everywhere. Um, that, that that stuff now becomes this thing that can be used at, at any time in this, you know, in this very automated system. I mean that's what this was. Is they just take a simple sample, they upload it and the computer spits out mm -hmm. an answer. Um, that it's it, – it almost depersonalizes the whole process in a way that – and I think that, that that level of depersonalization often creeps us out that we've removed what looks like the human agency and the, you know, the, the cat and mouse chase and instead now it's just like you kind of feed the information into a computer and then the it clacks away and the lights flash and then this this printout slides out and says, here's your man. It's like the the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, what's the answer to uh, the, life the universe and everything? Life the universe and everything. And what was it? 42 or 42? Yeah. Yeah. So it just spits it right out. Well, there, there's a – when it comes to the kind of inherent creepiness to this, uh, like there's a literal building a composite image. Uh, that's baked into the process. So there's a new uh, DNA da database called Parabon, which – so most of these like 23andMe, Ancestry, they were created targeting kind of amateur genealogists like like Matthew. Um, some of them are open source. People like download their information from 23andMe and upload it to things like GED Match, which is like the Firefox to 23andMe's uh, Internet Explorer, I guess, or something like that. And um, that's what the police accessed. But this new Parabon is saying, no, no, we're going to actually create a product specifically targeted for law enforcement agencies. But one of their things, if you go on the website, and we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes, they, they generate phenotype-based composite images. So like you're this percentage of, of Middle Eastern, you're this percentage of North African, this percentage of West Europe, uh, and we'll create a composite image that looks like you. And it's creepy because it's you know the, the the hit and miss rate is kind of all over the place they look it's like a lot of police sketches <laughs> there's some infamously bad ones you know the my favorite is when they're doing one of those uh, crime shows and they sit the they set the victim down with the police sketch artist and they come up with this um blobby picture of someone and does this look like the person who attacked you and <laughs> sometimes you get that look in their eyes where they're like uh, not really at all but I'm going to say so because that's what I'm expected to do at this point in time but there is something kind of creepy about that that just based off of my genetic information um, an image that may or may not be accurate accurate an accurate reflection of me is being generated and that's what the police are now going to look for uh, and there's, of course, a potential for uh, um, mistakes and abuse going on there as well that like, oh, this person looks a blend of North, you know, uh, North African and Middle Eastern. That's who we're looking for. OK, go get them, guys. And there's a lot of potential for um, you know, police bias to slip but, in there as well. But doesn't it have a baked in check against – not not the abuse in the sense of them hunting for all sorts of people and using this thing maybe more than they should, but in the you know getting the wrong man, yeah. because the only way that this that they start this process in the first place is that they have some of the, you know the the murderer or the rapist or whoever else's DNA and they upload it into the system. So even if the system spits out a a image that happens to look like you, and so they think that now you're a suspect, they then have the I mean the obvious step is to then check your DNA against the original source and that's going to clear it up right away. So you can't the, – the like getting wrongfully convicted out of this particular investigative technique seems much more difficult than other. It will only gets you so far. I mean so uh, Matthew uh, kind of alluded to this that with the catching the Golden State Killer, they first actually – did a false positive ID of a, a guy in a nursing home in Oregon, who they then managed to to you know exclude out by doing a direct DNA sample. But there is the potential here for um, depending on how good your match is. So like if it's a second cousin and a second cousin, the overlap of their DNA is fairly close to you. You can do pretty well. But if it's like a second cousin and a third cousin, the DNA overlap, and I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but the farther away they are, the less the match is and the less certain the match is. You're really narrowing it down to like a family or a multi-family, like a you know, the 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 closer the match, the farther down the tree you can go, closer to the roots. Um, but the less the match, the higher up you are. So you have a real potential for false positives of of family members. Um so I mean the the historical example would be it's it's like 
the his, uh, example of President Thomas Jefferson, who, well, it, it is widely believed that he um, had, you know, he had a, an affair with Sally Hemings, his slave. Though whether it's an affair or rape is is questionable, given the you know consent with a slave being problematic. Well, we actually don't know that for sure. What we know is someone in his family. There's probably eight male Jeffersons of his generation or the next generation, one of whom had sex with Sally Hemings. So there's a problem there, right? It can lead us to a group, but then it can kind of actually confirm our existing biases about which one we think it must be. So it's a, it's a tool, but it can be over predictive. Does that make sense? I wonder if the result then is – so one of the libertarian concerns about these kinds of databases is if they become useful. In, from law enforcement's perspective, that the government will then want us all to contribute our DNA to them, you know, because they become more useful to more people who are in them, and so the government will like, you know, does it just become part of? I, mean, I could see the kind of nightmare libertarian scenario of them just gathering, like your elementary school. You send your kids to elementary school, and as part of you know physical fitness day or whatever, they take a DNA <laughs> sample of your kid. Fitness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I wonder if the very problem you've identified. Almost solves that problem for the government without it having to institute a program of forcibly getting people's DNA. Because if the result is as more and more investigators use this technique, so this we have this case. It's been used a handful of times, but it's not it's not like a standard investigatory technique. But as it becomes one, where they're just like, you know, we've got DNA evidence. The first time we find DNA evidence, we're going to upload it and we're going to see what we get. It's just a standard step. Um, then. The, the likelihood that any one of us will at some point get the cops will come to our door and say, hey, we you know think you might be a match. Can you know we need to get a direct DNA sample from you? That's going to go. That's going to go up to the point where you can imagine a world where any one of us has been harassed in this way multiple times, and so you get sick of getting harassed. And so the way you stop getting harassed is to say, well, screw it. I'll upload my specific DNA to the database so then they don't even come to me in the first place because they've already checked their sample against mine and ruled me out. And so we all kind of opt in just to get rid of the harassment of people wanting us to check it out. Yeah, there's this very creepy prospect of uh, law enforcement just slowly building the family tree of the United States with like all this cooperation <laughs> yeah. of sharing files that uh, actually, you know, it's um, it's it's by no means here yet. But that's that's the nightmare scenario, right? Is that they will be able to to do this? And and I think Aaron alluded to this earlier, which is this is something where um, you can be identified despite being absent from the data set, right? right. That they can sort of they can find you. Uh, in virtue of you never having uploaded the DNA yourself, and uh, again, Golden State Killer, not a particularly sympathetic character by any means, uh, but like Aaron said, we leave our DNA all over the place, uh, and it's uh, rather odd to think that even if you're the sort of person who takes steps to think, okay, I'm only going to pay in cash, and I'm going to use encryption, and I'm going to do everything I can to be invisible to the state, just by walking around, uh, you're going to be leaving traces uh, through in, in virtue of biology. Uh, and that is, um, that's an interesting and disturbing prospect, right? Uh, because uh, your, your your privacy here is, is being um, people. I th many people will feel that their privacy is being violated by hundreds of their distant relatives being interested in history, uh, which is uh, a strange idea. Just a quick question about that. Then, are we do we find that more or less creepy than widespread surveillance, like facial recognition and cameras everywhere? Hmm. And and if if it's more or less, like what is it about that that is more or less creepy? Because they're both similar. Like your the, this facial recognition is you out in the world, kind of leaving information about yourself that that the the technology is now making accessible. So I think it goes back to what you, you mentioned earlier. That depends on the investigatory technique. So both of this can be used in different ways. Where you can imagine a situation where you you have a suspect on a videotape, right? But you and you think, okay, I want to find out who this is. So let's plug this face into whatever facial recognition databases, and something will spit out. Uh, this isn't really like that. It's it's like um, you know, let some um, have a canvas of faces and find and we'll see whatever hits. You know, just throw in these databases and we'll get a lot of pings, uh, and using that we'll in investigate it more. Uh, 
speak I, I do find facial recognition, the prospect of that being ubiquitous, very creepy. Uh, More be, creepy than the DNA stuff? Uh, at the moment only, but I think I might only think that because facial recognition is actually more prevalent than I think many people realize. Um, and in fact, about half of American adults already in some kind of facial recognition database. Uh, so yeah, that that's my gut feeling at the moment, but that will change as this kind of technique becomes uh, more widely used. And not that this would allay your concern, but it's there's an inevitability to this, which is that the percentage of people you need to actually opt in to a database is very, very small. So like 23andMe has 5 million um, samples uploaded. You can already get Perhaps uh, uh, by one estimate, 94% of the U.S. population could be identified based off that that by a second cousin to a reasonable degree of certainty from 5 million. To get the entire – I mean 5 million is a percentage of the national population is very small. Um, my, I can't do the numbers off the top of my head, but it's a very small percentage. You do not need many more to essentially get 100% of uh, – 100% identification ratio to a plausible degree of certainty to a second cousin. And that's going to happen. So you don't need the federal government to ro roll out a database because we're already almost there with a privately provided database. Well, then, and this is a question for Matthew then the, on the on the legal side because the, um, the, the what is it, GED – Match. Match. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's like an open source system that anyone can just pop in and and access and look things up. But 23andMe is not. Like I can't I can't log into 23andMe and just start looking up people by DNA information. Uh, so what's the what's the legal framework here? Like if they, you know, 23andMe may be able to identify 94% of the population, but is is that technique accessible? To law enforcement right well, now. Well, in fact, with a lot of these services, you can find relatives, and you'll get automated emails that say, like, "Oh, we found a estimated, as as you know, was mentioned, an estimated fourth cousin. Do you want to connect?" And it's like a social media site. You connect, and uh, you can compare the, the the whatever segments of DNA you share. Uh, and there, it seems like really difficult to make a privacy argument, right? Because both of you have volunteered for this service for that reason, right? It's not uh, as if we uploaded it not for family history but because we want to find everyone who has a certain gene for, I don't know, brown eyes or, or whatever. Uh, and that's the really interesting thing about this case is that the privacy argument seems rather weak because the only reason someone would have uploaded that information to GED Match is to do the kind of thing that was done, which was to identify distant relatives. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the legal argument is um, not – not not helpful if you're the sort of person creeped out by this. Uh, there was one, someone, uh, there was some discussion about this case, obviously, among privacy scholars after it was announced. And there was some uh, discussion about, well, is there a possibility that maybe the police violated the law because they had to fake being someone in order to upload- like Terms of service violation. Right. Uh, but it turns out that that's totally fine. And actually, there are provisions of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act that allow police to- do this. Uh, so yeah, not much to go on legally as far as protections go. So there's a comparison I think here to um, f other Fourth Amendment uh, issues like uh, cell phone tracking, which Matthew, you've written about some here. So I'll get your input in a second. But uh, where your cell phone's constantly pinging against towers and that information is you, you can't – I mean it's very hard to avoid living in the modern world without your cell phone pinging on towers. And uh, for a long time, law enforcement argued that they did not need a warrant to get access to that information. That, yeah. that just because you let that information out into the world, it's now fair game for the police, like your trash is behind your house. That The, the police can rifle through that without a warrant. Um, recently, courts have said, no, 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 you actually do need a warrant to get that ping data from, from providers, um, in, in, at least in some cases. So, I mean, I, I would propose that there is a similar situation here. One of the problems with GED match is that the police didn't have to get a warrant to do anything that they did in that process. Well, yeah, the question is who would you even serve a warrant to in the sense that they're just using the information that the website's providing them, right? It's not it, – again, it's not like GED match had the suspect's DNA and the police wanted to get the DNA data to right, compare right, right, to right. the crime scene. Uh, and – if you look at websites that do this, 23andMe, Ancestry, whatever, you know, they say, look, we, we comply with valid court orders. But if you look at their, uh, their data, they, 
it's very rare for police to actually look at these sites at the moment. Um, and we should probably expect this to increase, but it's still a very rare technique. Uh, and in fact, I think I think I'm correct in pointing out that most of the time that they actually do this, it's for not not the kind of uh, cases we're discussing here, but mostly like doing with identity yeah. fraud yeah. and things like that. And yes, you're you're right to point out that recently the Supreme Court made a decision uh, related to a case about uh, cell site location information, but it was very very narrow. Uh, any listeners who want to look it up can find uh, Carpenter v. United States. Uh, but that 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 had to do with uh, police access of um, physical location data as obtained via cell tower location information. But the court you know, five to four found yes, uh, it is a violation of your reasonable expectation of privacy to physical location for police to gather um, 127 days worth of that information without a warrant. And they were like, well. Finding out your physical location for more than six or seven days uh, with without a warrant is, uh, you know, that that's not okay. Uh, that you do need a warrant for more than six or seven days. Uh, but it's it's not a case that particularly uh, helps out here. That's yeah. for sure. Uh, there was another um, uh, court case that I think applies, and this is more of an Aaron kind of question. Uh, there, I like those. Yeah, right. <laughs> there was a um, – it was actually a dissent by Antonin Scalia, the, the late Antonin Scalia, who was joined by the more liberal members of the court, uh, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, Kagan. And it was about a situation in Maryland or Virginia where someone's um, DNA was, again, kind of used in a similar method, but it was not a private database. It was with uh, basically a – family familial match to a state maintained DNA database. And uh, the court ruled that was okay, but in this 5-4 dissent, uh, Scalia said, perhaps the construction of such a genetic panopticon is wise, but I would doubt that the proud men who wrote the Charter of Our Liberties would have been so eager to open their mouths for royal inspection. Uh, and then uh, Matt Ford, who's a journalist from the New Republic, commented, six years later, it turns out that the American people may have built that genetic panopticon themselves, one self-swab at a time, which is great writing. But Aaron, like, so when he's, when Scalia talks about a genetic panopticon, what is what's he referring to there, and do you think that actually applies to this situation? Yeah. So when you put this in the um, in our outline for today, I I commented that I wasn't sure how the metaphor worked. Um, so for for listeners who aren't familiar with the Panopticon, this was a um, Jeremy Bentham thought it was an amazing idea that he had thought up, and then Foucault came along later and said, no, 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 this is actually a horrific idea. Um, and I think Foucault had was more right, but it's it was his his perfect prison. Right, so what you have is this prison that's built in the round. So, all in a, in a circle all around are are cells that people you know jail cells, and so they're all the the bars are all facing inwards towards the center of the big room, and in the center of the big room is a tower, and a person a, a guards can sit in that tower, and and the guards are not visible to the prisoners, um, but the prisoners are all visible at any time to a guard who happens to look in that direction. And, and so the idea is like the guards can keep their eyes on all of the prisoners at once. Um, but, but where it gets particularly creepy is that because the guards can't be seen by the prisoners, the, no given prisoner at any time knows if they're being watched. And, and the idea then is that you don't actually have to then be watching the prisoners all the time because the prisoners will kind of start self-policing because they will assume at any given moment that they're being watched. And so they'll act as if at any given moment they're being watched. And so to some extent, you could get away with having no guard in the tower because the prisoners all end up kind of assuming a non-existent guard potentially. Right, right. So that's that's the panopticon and that – you can see that. That makes a lot of sense in the like ubiquitous surveillance and the facial recognition because you have no – you know, you're out in public or you're out anywhere. You could be being watched at any time. So you're going to act as if you're being watched and so you're, you're going to moderate your behavior with that in mind and not do anything that you think might get you in trouble. But I'm not totally sure how that applies to a DNA database because they, it's, it's not like your DNA is being watched potentially at all times. Um, 
and and you're leaving this stuff all over the place no matter what you do. And that DNA, because we all know that Lamarckianism is not correct, that DNA is not somehow, you know, it has not like embedded in itself the information about your behaviors and activities. Right, right. Yeah, I I think uh, Scalia I think is rightly renowned as a good writer, but I'm not sure if his um pen does justice to the facts of the case here, right? Uh, I do think that this case, Maryland v. King, it, Scalia's dissent will in the future, I'm sure, be viewed as a very prescient piece of writing. Uh, the case, though, involved uh, Maryland's database of cold case uh, DNA, right? So there's this guy, Alonso, I believe his name was Alonso King, was arrested for assault and when he was arrested under Maryland law, he, he, his cheek was swabbed and then there was a ping. It matched DNA related to a unsolved rape and he was convicted of that rape and that was the appeal to the Supreme Court where uh, he was making uh, – and I think Scalia was right to point this out – like a rather plausible claim that you know you need – um, some degree of suspicion uh, to you can't the, the Maryland's argument was basically this is just like fingerprinting. It's just used to ID people. Like this is no different to another ID verification method. But as we've discussed, I mean, the amount you can find out about someone from their DNA goes well beyond uh, actually anything to do with the person, but also their family, uh, medical conditions they might even not know they carry. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very revealing piece of- uh, And but, there's contamination yeah. issues. With, I mean, just yeah, because right. you find their DNA doesn't mean that they were actually on the site at that time committing that murder. I mean, there's- yeah. Sure. But I guess I don't- you say it's not like a fingerprint and that yes, we can find all this other information, but- in, in the circumstance at hand, so we have we have DNA from a crime scene that we found um, and now we have a person who we're curious about and we're going to check to see if they match the person who was at the crime scene. That looks indistinguishable from the fingerprint thing. Like, so yes, they could also have found out that he had, was at risk for Parkinson's disease but that's utterly irrelevant to anything that they're doing. Like, I, I guess I, I'm having a hard time seeing why this – ought to creep us out more than fingerprints um, that you you know you fingerprint someone when you you take them in for whatever reason and then you happen to just also upload that fingerprint to a database to see if that person you know connects to any past crimes like that doesn't seem that doesn't seem terribly bothersome to me well there's a I mean is there an issue here of overconfidence in the method so like even if the use of the DNA in the situation as a piece of like supporting evidence is defensible. Using it as a, like, oh, we found his DNA, therefore, absent any kind of circumstantial evidence or other evidence of, of him being at the crime scene or being a suspect, just that bit of information alone is enough to secure a conviction. I mean, in other words, the specifics, specifics of the case, the way in which they use, used it is problematic, not the fact that they use the evidence, period. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think consider the the slippery slope we're on uh, because I think Aaron's right to point out that, look, when we're talking about violent criminals, you're not going to get many uh, people concerned here, but listeners should, if they have the opportunity, actually listen to the oral argument of Marilyn V. King. It's one of the most interesting pieces of oral argument I've heard because uh, the Maryland attorney stands up and says, well, since we've started this, we've secured so many convictions and so many arrests and Scalia jumps in and says, oh, that's great. I bet you could get even more if you conducted even more unreasonable searches and seizures, right? Uh, the point being that you could always defend the collection of more data. Uh, by arguing that you will secure convictions for violent and serious crimes, uh, and that's right, but that that shouldn't be used as a justification for gathering an increasing amount of data. Period. Yeah. Well, uh, this is good, but let's let's move the conversation to kind of the more positive spin, right? I mean, I, I think it's interesting that none of us. I mean, there there are risks to how this information is used. Um, there are potential missteps, false IDs. But there's nothing inherent to the idea of a uh, of a DNA collection that necessarily is fundamentally like anti-liberty or anti-libertarian. Um, but why don't we look at the plus side? Like it'd be a mistake, I think, to only look at the potential downsides. Um, let's look at the advantages of a DNA database for ordinary people's prosperity, health, and happiness. Um, the the two examples that come to mind are a 
ad- adoption, the case of pe- adopted folks trying to find their birth families, um, as well as the kind of medical innovation implications. Um, on the ad- adoption front, I mean, there is still a concern, right? Like you may want to find your birth parent, but that doesn't mean your birth parent wants you to find them. And um, this makes it easier to kind of broach that barrier. Like you used to get stopped by not not find your way or, you know, the documents are lacking at your, I don't know, your orphanage or or whatnot. But now you can find – there's a chance you'll be able to find your parent even though they've gone out of their way to make it hard for you to do so. Uh, so I imagine there will be some drama over individual cases like that. On the, on the flip side, you, you know, there's a lot of folks who are going to find birth parents and both sides will be delighted and – Thank goodness there was that DNA database. Yeah, I think, uh, well, not being a parent myself, but I think anyone who gives up a child for adoption must know that there is a chance, mm-hmm. like even if they want to remain anonymous, especially in the age of 23 and me, that this could happen. Uh, so you give up your child for adoption and then years later that child spits in a tube and gets the ancestry information back and you think you're in the clear because you didn't have the service, but it turns out your brother did, yeah. right? So then your child has figured out like, oh, well, I've identified an uncle, but I haven't identified a parent. And you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out who your uh, <laughs> parent <laughs> is once you've discovered that. Uh, so that, I, I'm trying to think about what what kind of solution there could be to this problem, but I don't even really view it as a problem well, uh, it, in the in the, sen- in the way I think you're trying to highlight it. Well, I mean, there's that sense of, I mean, the... the the way I would put it is that uh, to to think of it as a problem, as I was kind of mooting, is to misunderstand who owns your genetic information, right? Like, yes, your parents have an identity and there's a certain amount – their genetic code is unique to them and you can maybe argue some kind of ownership right over that. And we do, which is why these organizations have you sign waivers. They, you're signing the waiver to your privacy right of your genetic information. At the same time, you pass on a significant portion of that genetic, genetic information to your children. They own a right to that information. And so in other words, the genetic overlap between you and your parent belongs to both of you. Right, like just as much as you have the right of, uh, as as a parent to control your your genetic information, so too do your kids. Yet that information overlaps, and if that, I mean, that's something that you really just can't. You both have a legitimate ethical claim to ownership of that. I, I can think of a potential positive related to the adoption that isn't limited to just the adoption. So we're recording this on what August second, and tomorrow, August third, on my other podcast, Free Thoughts, we're releasing an episode with Adam Bates about the refugee situation. Mm -hmm. And refugees, I mean, they face a lot of horrors, Um, some of them the result of their situation, quite a lot of them the result of the way that governments treat them. But one of the problems that they have is they come into – they get admitted to a new country, a refugee makes in the US and now what? You know, they've left behind Mm -hmm. everything that they had. They – they maybe don't know the language. They maybe would have a hard time finding a job, whatever else. Um, this this might enable them to, you know, families are powerful networks for support, and so you can, you know, I don't know anyone in this country, but if I can upload my information to Twenty Three and Me, I might be able to find some second cousins, some third cousins, who I can, you know, they might not want to help me, but they also might want to help me, and it gives you it gives you a potential ability to find a support network. Mm-hmm. In an easier way than just stumbling around asking people. So uh, your mention of refugees reminded me of another, uh, not intentional, but a definite benefit of these kind of websites is that uh, they they uh, are used uh, by racist assholes uh, who want to prove uh, a lot of their purity. And turns out that uh, people who claim to be white supremacists might be a little bit African or a little bit Jewish. And uh, maybe an added benefit of this is actually it's it's helping. Educate uh, more more people about that old cliche that we're all related, and that actually you shouldn't care as much about your race as you really do. Uh, but of course, as they will claim, you know, uh, Twenty Three and Me is a Jewish conspiracy, so we <laughs> can't right. take that. But, <laughs> uh, but I do, I do find yeah. all of that uh, kind of stuff actually a, a real added benefit if yeah. we can learn more about the history of the species and migration. Uh, that's an added benefit, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's you know. it's like the white supremacist version of. Uh, 
you know, uh, the Henry Louis Gates show for I think it's for history uh, where they go and various celebrities and they're like and inevitably it turns out no matter who the celebrity is your family owns slaves because is it's this, uh, ri- who, who do you think you are is this uh, that sounds right yeah, yeah this is yeah. another American show stolen from uh, Great British Television oh, uh, yeah but you know really. uh, well, I was well, wanted to do well, find and made better uh, yeah, as yeah. you did with the governmental system that they tried to but you didn't do it with the office. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's arguable, but uh, um, so the, I think the last point, uh, big point we should make here, is to tie this to the advantages for medical innovation. So um, you mentioned like refugees who are disconnected from family networks, but whether you're a refugee or you're adopted or for whatever reason you don't have access to family knowledge about medical conditions. Mm-hmm. Like I know that there's a family history of colon cancer in my family, so because of that, I'm taking steps. Keep an eye on that more so I'm doing testing earlier than I would if I didn't have that knowledge. So there's a real huge advantage for these databases and allowing people to detect those kind of family issues that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. I mean, this should actually ext- literally extend people's lives because they're going to be able to take earlier preventive uh, measures. Um, so that's that's a big component. That's the most obvious one. Uh, the other one that comes to mind, uh, 23andMe just signed a deal with GlaxoSmithKline uh, for $300 million um, to use 23andMe's database to help create targeted uh, medicines over the next decade. And the idea, again, that if you can go find all these genetic markers across large populations, um, multiple family trees, they're going to be able to do a better job of identifying which genetic markers correlate to which disorders and diseases and then target that very specifically. I mean, here comes potential someday in the future of like a CRISPR-enabled um, boutique medicine targeting a particular disease across particular family lines and essentially eradicate, eradicating whole new categories of uh, genetic diseases. So, I mean, we, we, that, there's really cool possibilities here um, going forward. And I think it would be a mistake to allow our concerns, legitimate concerns over privacy, law enforcement use, uh, national databases to cause us to kind of impede some of the beneficial aspects of these databases for people's health and prosperity and, and happiness. So on that note, I think we'll call the close for today's episode. Thank you for listening. And until next week, be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.